battle here at Petersburg has turned into a siege and it cannot last. We have to push those rebels out of their trenches. You're going to march across this field, volley, and storm their positions. Make sure your first shot is true. Only fire at close range. Then close with your bayonet and finish the job. Yes, sir. Warn the battalion on the first, Sergeant. Shoulder. Arm. Battalion. Forward. March. theme of then and now is hitting the mark. We're going to take a look at how the commander's expectations of the average soldier have changed using the standard battle rifle or service rifle of the period. In particular, we're going to look at four primary factors when hitting the mark. Rate of fire, accuracy, range, and target engagement in low light conditions. In World War I, the American Doughboy would have been going to Europe with this rifle, the 1903 Springfield. It was a weapon that was primarily developed on the firing range, not necessarily in combat. One area that that affected the ability of the Doughboy to hit on target is the sights. They're much more like target sights and not combat sights. The rate of fire is somewhat limited with this weapon because it's a manually operated bolt action rifle with only a five round capacity fed by stripper clips. This meant in close assaults, it would be easy to be overrun as a doughboy with a bolt action rifle like the 03 Springfield. The average soldier in World War I would have been expected to put a high rate of fire at a long distance, so-called volley fire, with this rifle. That was the current thinking in that era. Once they got into the static trench warfare in Europe, they found out that thinking was off the mark. The 03 Springfield had developed a reputation on the firing range of being extremely accurate. 
So the average soldier in Europe would have been expected to hit the mark because of this rifle. Although the need for a smaller weapon with a higher rate of fire became apparent in the trenches, one thing's for sure, with a bayonet or with a butt stroke, if you got into hand-to-hand -hand combat, you could put in a world of hurt on somebody. This particular comparison is the 03 Springfield five-shot bolt-action rifle versus the Vietnam-era M16. The task at hand is to put 10 rounds of accurate fire 100 yards downrange. Well, Aaron, I think we knew how that was going to shake out. Yeah, that's why the firearms engineers get paid big bucks. Well, five shots, I didn't even load ten. I would have had to put five rounds on a stripper clip, and I didn't even manipulate the safety like you. So when you race against your grandpa, what do you expect? This segment of Tactical Impact is brought to you by TAPCO. On the morning of February 28, 1997, two career criminals robbed the Bank of America in North Hollywood, California. As they left the bank, they were confronted by dozens of police officers. Shielded by their body armor and at times using their car as cover, the robbers instantly engaged the police with fully automatic assault rifles, spraying the area with armor-piercing bullets and eventually wounding 10 officers and 7 civilians. The police were stunned to find that their 9mm pistols and 12-gauge shotguns were incapable of penetrating the thieves' body armor. North Hollywood, California, one of the biggest shootouts in modern law enforcement history took place. It was an incident that had great impact on the weapons and tactics employed by law enforcement throughout this country. Two heavily armed bank robbers attempted to take out the LAPD. At 9.38 a.m. that morning, Larry Phillips, one of the two bank robbers, exited the north entrance to the bank. As soon as he came out, he began engaging some of the LAPD patrol officers who responded to the shots fired call. The responding officers realized this was not their typical bank robber. He had automatic weapons, a lot of ammunition, and heavy-duty body armor. If I were in North Hollywood that day and I was choosing a weapon for this particular engagement, one of the factors I would take into account is the extended engagement distances, especially by law enforcement standards. So I would want a weapon that I could hit accurately with at distance. The second thing would be firepower. I'd want a caliber that could punch through body armor. And last but not least is magazine capacity. I'd want more bullets if I could get it. Okay, now it's time to choose your weapon. Your choices are a G36 556 select fire assault rifle, a 308 battle rifle with a 20 round magazine, or a Beretta 92 9 mm service pistol common in law enforcement and military use. The Beretta 92 service pistol would be a tough choice here, but one advantage it had was the availability of ammunition from other officers. At the extended engagement distances that day in North Hollywood, the 9mm Beretta just would not have got the job done. The G36 would have been an excellent choice that day in North Hollywood. Some of the reasons why it would have been a good choice is number one, it's a rifle caliber. Number two, magazine capacity. I've got 60 rounds on my body ready to go now. And third, accuracy. This is an extremely accurate weapon. The G36 no doubt would have been an excellent choice that day. However, when going up against adversaries with body armor, if you can get a heavier caliber than 5.56, that would be a better choice. If I would have been at the North Hollywood shootout, my first choice would have been a 30 caliber battle rifle, if available. It has the horsepower to penetrate body armor as well as a large magazine capacity. At 
disengagement distance with a 308 battle rifle, car penetration and body armor is no problem. The M1 Garand was the standard service rifle in World War II. It was a huge improvement over the previous battle rifle the United States used. One of the reasons it was better is its rate of fire was improved. It's got eight rounds now, plus it's semi-automatic. Makes the recoil go down a little bit, plus you have three extra rounds. With the M1 Garand, the average soldier was expected to be much more accurate than the previous 03 Springfield. The primary reason for that improvement in accuracy would have been the improvement in sights. As compared to the 03 Springfield, which had a very crude notch and post system, the Garand utilizes a front post with a round rear aperture, which is a much better combat sight. The expectations of the average soldier would have also been to be able to engage targets at great distance. This was accomplished by maintaining and keeping that 30 6 caliber, which has plenty of punch for a long ways. In my opinion, the M1 Garand is probably one of the greatest service rifles ever developed. It was a watershed of improvement, better sights, semi-automatic, more rounds. This gun got it done. In this comparison, we're going to take a look at rate of fire. The drill is going to be fire 10 rounds at 100 yards as fast as we can while maintaining relative accuracy. I've got an M1 Garand, Larry's got an M4. A little bit of an advantage, let's see if I can't keep up. Well, Aaron, what we saw there was 5.56 versus 30-06 in recoil impulse. Also, magazine capacity, 30 rounds, and 10 rounds in this case, and an eight round clip. Uh, it was kind of an unfair comparison, and uh, anybody could have done that, Larry. All right, the drill is 50 yards, five rounds a piece, under low light conditions. I've got the iron sided M1 Garand. Larry's got an M4 with an aim point. The expectation of the average soldier operating at low light with the M1 Garand would have been better than the 03 Springfield because it did have a few advents, but without the capabilities that came on about 50 years later, really would have been pretty grim. The M4 with a red dot optic means that the average soldier is now expected to be accurate in low light as well as no light situations. This segment of Tactical Impact is brought to you by FNH USA.